Hello, and welcome to Checking the Vitals, a podcast powered by Specialty Care. I'm Todd Schlosser, and in our third episode of the Heart of the Operation series, we talk to Ryan Curtis, an area clinical manager for perfusion at Specialty Care. We discuss what made him decide to switch careers from a funeral director to perfusion. We also discuss the positives and negatives of attending a 12-month perfusion program and the differences between working for an in-house program or a third-party program. Enjoy the conversation. So, Ryan, thank you so much for joining us here on Checking the Vitals. I like to start out all of the interviews a very similar way, and that is simply to ask, what was it that made you want to work in a career in healthcare? So, my journey to healthcare was uh, kind of unique. Um, perfusion is a second career for me. Oh, is it? Uh, okay. My previous uh, career, I was in the funeral business. I was a funeral director or an embalmer. Oh, wow. And um, so, I always liked uh, the combination of the science and the, um, uh, you know, dealing with uh, people, uh, business aspects. And so I had a friend who uh, was also a nurse and was a funeral director. And he had told me, you know, you should be a, a perfusionist. And I'm like, you know, what's a, what's a perfusionist? Like, what's that? Saying. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. So I did a little research and, and kind of found some uh, interesting tie-ins between how uh, perfusion works and in the funeral business specifically with the bombing process and uh, just kind of followed that path and uh, luckily I had some good guidance and good friends to help me along the way and uh, got into school and uh, the rest is history I guess you would call it. Yeah absolutely so let me ask this because you mentioned there was a little bit of overlap between uh, sort of funeral directing and then perfusion do you mind if we talk a little bit about that because that that sure. sort of fascinates me so what what is that overlap between those two fields? So the principle of embalming and the principle of perfusion are very similar. You are, uh, in the simplest terms, pumping a fluid. Uh, perfusion, obviously, it's the patient's own blood. Sure. Uh, embalming, it's a preservative chemical into an artery and uh, draining the vein. Uh, perfusion, obviously, you're keeping the patient alive during the, the procedure. Embalming, you're chemically preserving the disease for uh, right. a, a viewing. So. Uh, that was very helpful for me, uh, understanding the process when I got into perfusion school, um, you know, the cardiac anatomy, how the vessels work, that type of thing. So um, although they're two totally opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to patient care, I guess you'd call it. Sure, uh, yeah. It uh, really helped uh, my understanding of perfusion because it, you know, it was a very unique uh, profession. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we don't really talk to many funeral directors. So, yeah, that's I'd imagine that that's a sort of a unique path. It's su super interesting. Sure. So y you decide, OK, I'm going to take the leap from, you know, working at a funeral home, I'd imagine, uh, to I'm going to pursue a career in perfusion. Correct. How did you sort of start applying and how did you end up in the school that you went to and what perfusion school was that? So I went to uh, Texas Heart Institute in Houston, Texas. OK. Um, once. Uh, I started looking deeper into the schools, again, having good relationships with the hospitals at the time because I was, you know, there on a regular basis, you know, if someone were to pass away and yeah. through working, was able to contact a perfusionist, uh, shadowed, and he happened to go to Texas Heart. And so I thought, well, you know, that seems like a good spot. So uh, did some more research on their reputation. I think they were the first perfusion school to start 1972, I believe. Oh, wow. Great reputation. And then another thing, because it was a second career for me, uh, the program was very condensed. So it was 12 months. Oh, okay. Because I've heard it could take up to like almost two years. Yeah, th there is a wide variety. And now I know um, that program has been extended to 18 months. But um, in my mind, you know, I had a house to sell and, yeah. you know, those types of things. So it was like, if I can get through this the quickest, um, you know, save some money, that type of thing, along with the yeah. reputation. So that was actually the only school that I applied to. And um, in retrospect, probably not the best idea. Uh, very competitive. <laughs> I sure. probably should have you know, done a little more uh, window shopping with the other programs. I drove by, I mean, two or three schools on the way there. I'm like, I could have applied to Iowa or Nebraska or Omaha, but that's right. what I got with. So that's what I'm going to do. And so just kind of, I lucked out, I guess. Did it turn out to be a good decision though? Did you enjoy going to Texas Heart? I did. It was a great decision. Um, Texas Arts has been a pioneer in a lot of, uh, you know, technologies, a lot of, you know, transplants and VADs, and they do every case on the spectrum. 
again, very condensed. So if you can pump a case at Texas Heart, you can, you know, pump a case anywhere. Um, yeah. Even down to the weather, uh, I'm a native of South Dakota, so not having to scoop the walk at 5 a.m. You know, minus 10 <laughs> was a, a big plus. So overall, it was a, a great decision. Um, I love what I do. I can't imagine, you know, doing anything else. And just how the whole uh, perfusion profession works and what we do behind the pump. You know, there's some days I, you know, just shake my head. I can't believe that that's what I get to do and you know, I get paid for this on top of it. it's just kind of a bonus because it's truly miraculous uh, yeah, stuff. It really is. You guys do some amazing work that I think most people were sort of like you were when your friend told you you should be a perfusionist and you were like, okay, well, what's that? I think right. most people would respond that way. Most people have no idea what that is. I know I didn't until I, start, until I started working in this industry. So right. I'd like to sort of talk about some of that stuff. But before we do, because you're – uh, training or I guess schooling because you're always sort of learning on the job in perfusion. Right. So that condensed program, it was it. And I realize I'm going to ask you about your specific experience, knowing you didn't go to an 18 month program right after to see what the right. difference is, but the people you've talked to was your condensed experience, I would say more challenging or was it, uh, I mean, how did they make up that time? I guess that is my biggest question. How sure. did they condense it? Very condensed. Um, so we would get to school roughly, I'd say 5.30 to 6 in the morning. And okay. you could be there till 9 at night. So it's long hours. So long hours. You had to be very focused, very disciplined. Obviously, there was no opportunity to work outside of the program, which the uh, program highly recommended not to be you know, employed at the same time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you would come in and you would set your room up and you'd be assigned a case and they'd kind of have a roster and you would set it up and you'd maybe do a case and they'd schedule a lecture and you'd go up to the classroom and do your lecture. And then you might come back down and observe another case. Um, you also took call. So if you were the call person, you were paired up with a staff who was also on call. So okay. something came up on a weekend or the night you were coming back in. So right. uh, very saturated, very intense. You had to have a lot of self-discipline to study on your own because there might be instances just the way the program worked where you might have a lecture on a Monday and then you might not have your exam for a week or two later. And it's, you know, you had the assigned reading and some, maybe a PowerPoint or some notes. So you really had to fill in the gaps with learning that right. uh, topic because, you know, there weren't assignments or that type of thing. It was like, this is the topic you take the test and, and that was your grade. So uh, like I said, a lot of discipline, very, it was, yeah. essentially it was two years crammed into one. I think a lot of the other programs have year one, that's all didactic or it's classroom and semester system. Sure. And year two is the clinical and Texas heart kind of crams it all into one. So you either get it or, or you don't. So do you start getting that? And when I say hands-on experience, I'm sure early on, you're not actually the one behind the pump. You're sort of observing someone behind the pump. And then yep. eventually they sort of, you know, you phase in as the person who, you know, is there to like guide you sort of phases out, but still is like looking over your shoulder and helping yep. you. Does yep. that process start day one at that program? Uh, we were in the OR, I'd say in the second week. Oh, wow. So, so it's pretty quick. Yep. Uh, learning how to set the pump up, just, you know, how the tubing feels, uh, yeah. the direction of the blood flow, how the knobs turn, you know, all those types of things. But, um, I want to say it was probably the end of the first month of the second month you started to do cases. Yeah. Now, granted, there was a, a senior student there with you and of course a staff. So uh, the staff's there to make sure you don't do anything inappropriate or wrong. I'm sure you and the senior student, which of course you then became before you graduated, uh, sure. you're there learning and they're there to make sure everything goes smoothly, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Because there's still a patient on the table. It's still working with the surgeons and ultimately it was the responsibility of the staff person. So yeah, um, it was just based off of uh, the student's comfort level, how they're responding to, you know, what they're being taught. So uh, but yeah, the staff was glued to your hip and, Oftentimes at the beginning, it was, you know, turn that knob, push that button. Yeah. You know, now do this. And it gradually, you know, to the point where you're at the end of the year and the staff's further away and they're just kind of watching and making sure that nothing goes wrong. But that was the great part is, you know, because we dove in with both feet right off the bat that Absolutely. towards the end of the year, it was, you know, not a, 
not a big deal to, I don't want to say do the case by yourself, but pretty close where sure. you had the comfort of the staff being there, but you were trusted with making the proper decisions based off of what the, what the case was. Yeah. And this may not be the case for every student, but I know for me, getting the hands-on experience really helps me sort of internalize the process and right. it makes me learn it a lot faster. And again, yep. it may not be that, that way for everybody, but I'd imagine jumping right in week two in the OR, even though you're probably not doing other than anything other than just like assisting setting up the pump, it's right. still hands-on experience. You're getting familiar with the pump uh, and even the patients and all of that stuff. So right. I'd imagine that that is very, very helpful, especially in a condensed class uh, of a year, right? Because you're trying to learn as much as, as possible, as quickly as possible. And yep. that can seem, I would imagine, uh, overwhelming. It was very overwhelming. Yeah. Um, I, I, my scrub cap was oftentimes soaked because I was, <laughs> you know, sweating and it's like, sure. you know, what are you sweating about? You're just like setting the pump up, but well, and ORs are cold, but you're still sweating because you're Correct. like, Oh my, am I doing this right? Yeah, right. absolutely. And I often had anxiety due to my former profession that it was like, you know, if I mess this up now, granted they would never let me do that, but I just had that self pressure on myself that, you know, yeah. bad things, you know, could happen. So I think oftentimes it's just, students put the pressure on themselves to, you know, there's always a little bit of competition there to who can pick it up the quickest, who can set it up the fastest. So. Sure. And even though there's a safety net there, I'm sure you approach it uh, or did when you were there that, you know, every case is your case and this is, you know, I'm doing this. It's nice to have the safety net, but you right. don't want to have it. You don't want to have to have it. Right. So Correct. you approach it as if you don't, and then it's there if you need it. Right. Cause yep, ideally exactly. even in the classroom setting, or I guess it wouldn't be classroom cause you're in the OR, but even in that, uh, I guess observation setting, you would prefer it if they never had to step in. Right. Sure. Uh, Absolutely. But if they do, they're there for the patient to make sure you're doing everything safely and for you to learn. So right. I definitely understand that. Yeah. Yep. So you graduate uh, and you're looking for a perfusion job. Were you looking specifically to move home or, you know, did you just apply sort of wherever? How did you end up where you ended up? So I kind of had an idea when I left South Dakota that it would be extremely rare for me to have the opportunity to return. Mm -hmm. um, I think at the time, and I think it's still current, there's maybe uh, off the top of my head, nine perfusionists like in the whole state. Oh, wow. Okay. And so I knew like, when I was leaving, it was probably going to be uh, for a while. So, yeah. Uh, and this was 2008. So there wasn't a ton of uh, openings at the time. Right. And so uh, if there were, I don't want to say applied to all openings, but if there were some kind of towards the end of the year, it was uh, looking around. So mm -hmm. I applied a job in Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, UCLA, uh, University of Virginia, and then Texas Heart, where I was a student. Right had an opening uh, for a uh, staff person. So I literally had every corner of the U.S. kind of pegged out. And, <laughs> yeah, and because so, there was a shortage, you couldn't be super picky. Right. So unlike Perfusion School, where you picked one school and applied to one place, you sort of right. maybe took the shotgun approach. And where did you I, end I up? Correct. I ended up at Texas Heart. So yeah. um, they had an opening, um, myself, and there were some other students that applied. And I got offered the position. And it was very flattering because uh, the way the director at the time, uh, Terry Crane, had stated, this whole year has been one giant job interview. Yeah. And so the resumes went, you know, through him and, and through the staff and for them to say that, you know, I was qualified and good enough to go from a student to a staff person was very flattering. And it was a it was a no brainer to be able to, uh, you know, take the position. Yeah, um, I could go from being taught to being a teacher, which I liked. Um, I didn't have to move. You know, there was many different um, yeah. reasons to, to stick around. So I uh, enjoyed it. My time yeah. there very much. So you work at Texas Heart for a number of years and then you transitioned to where you are now in Minneapolis. What brought about that change from Texas Heart to Minneapolis? So uh, my time that I spent in Houston uh, was all 100 percent clinical. Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, Texas Medical Center is the largest medical center in the world, so lots of transplants and VADs, and I got uh, a huge variety of clinical cases, uh, 10 years worth, and got uh, approached from a former a student that I taught at Texas Heart, who was a specialty care that lived in Minneapolis. Oh, yeah? Said that they had some openings, and um, it was a management position, and she thought it would be a good fit, and a lot of good changes were going on, and, and I thought it would be a good uh, step 
in my career to learn more of the have the opportunity to be in management, um, yeah. the business aspect, which was kind of missing in those 10 years. And, and again, kind of ties back to, uh, you know, my former career where there was a the science portion and the business portion. Right. So it kind of really came full circle and the opportunity to return to the Midwest uh, where I'm originally from again, not in South Dakota, but pretty close. And yeah. So uh, all those factors played a part. Excellent. But now you're up at, you know, 5 a.m. shoveling your walks some. Correct. Well, I have a condo, so, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they take care of all that. Correct. Absolutely. Uh, so you, uh, transitioned up to Minneapolis and now you're in a leadership role. So I'd imagine that you have people under you. I, I I'd assume you also still pump some cases. Is that a fair? Assessment? That is correct. Okay. It is still uh, active clinically and then have the uh, added responsibility of, uh, the management, the business side of it uh, also. So it's a, it's a nice variety. Sure. And this may not be a new skill set for you because when you were a funeral director, I'm sure you had um, direct reports, but was that a change for you from being a regular sort of clinical perfusionist to now having that, but also managing people under you? Yeah. So my uh, direct report, oftentimes our discussions are not so much clinical, but more of staffing, coverage, um, relationships with the hospitals and the surgeons down Mm -hmm. to uh, maybe new equipment that we're going to try, uh, disposables, ordering. So it's very broad now versus, you know, in the past when it was, you know, I would talk to my chief about, you know, a case that I had or a case that's coming up. Now it's a, a very broad uh, uh, topics that we discuss. Sure. Well, and, and you're also sort of managing the business side of it, too. So you're dealing with, you know, profit loss and all of that stuff, right? For sure. Definitely. Yeah. And, and I would say that's almost the majority of my communication uh, with my boss, uh, DJ Brancato, um, where it's inventory and it's, um, you know, equipment and items that might be on a recall or right. you know, lots of things that I had no idea, you know, prior being a hospital-based employee. This is my first position with a contract group that has uh, many different arms to it. So it's been a, a very good learning experience for me on how the whole process works versus just coming in, pumping a case and going home for the day. Sure. So let me ask this. So if someone is thinking about maybe perfusion as a career, but they're wanting to know more about sort of work-life balance, what would you say, or can you sort of rate your quality of life being a perfusionist? Is that work-life balance there? Are you working all the time or is it, you know, is it a good mix? Like, what is it like? Sure. So, Oftentimes with work-life balance and perfusion, it kind of depends on the facility that you work. Sure. If you're in a big city that's um, you know, known for doing VADs and transplants and, and high volume stuff, I would say it's maybe more of a feast or famine type situation where you right. might have a lull. Um, transplants, in my experience anyways, you know, rarely happen on noon on a Wednesday. It's usually you know, late at night or on a weekend. It just kind of depends on how it comes, but they seem like they're kind of later in the day. Yeah. Um, So, um, but to me, that's always been a a positive is that it's not just your standard eight to five, Monday through Friday. Yeah, absolutely. For me, exciting, you know, to be able to, you know, go in and do something as interesting that we do that it's off hours um, is neat. And it's, it gives a good variety, but overall, I, I would say, um, there is a good work-life balance um, and you kind of have to pick your poison in regards of, like I said, where you go um, with call versus, uh, you know, the cases that you do and the times that they're posted. So some people like to take more call and maybe have a more of a bread and butter account that does kind of the standard cases. And then there's other, you know, the other side of the fence where you might take less call, but you have the opportunity or not the opportunity, but the, the chance of being called in off hours nights weekend yeah. so it's kind of up to the person because i'd imagine if i was younger and i i just graduated and i think it would be fun to have you know on a friday night at six thirty in the and at night to have a surgeon call me and be like hey we're doing a transplant can you come in yeah let's do this that'll be awesome you know sure. that it sounds that sounds ex- exciting to me so if right. i was looking for that um, are there jobs that are okay? This job is definitely going to have that. And are there jobs that are perfusion jobs that are like this is more of an eight to five sort of a situation? Right. Does that make sense? It does. So how do you how do you know going in 
So it would be based off of uh, discussions, you know, in your interview process or even the job descriptions. Uh, the hospitals and the, the facilities are pretty good at stating um, we have an opening for a perfusionist. They do uh, 300 hearts a year and they do standard cabs and valves and, uh, right. you know, and occasionally aortic case. And then, and they've gotten to the point now where they'll specifically state, you know, at this location uh, does no VADs or ECMOs or uh, transplants. Okay. Other places will state, you know, we're a high volume uh, VAD transplant facility. So based off of the, the verbiage, you know, even in the job description, it'll, uh, the hospitals have, you know, been very good at explaining exactly what type of case volume and case load they do. Sure. So that, um, you know, they can attract the right applicants because, you know, obviously if someone doesn't want to, you know, pump every day of the week or at a place that does 15 or 1600 hearts that they come in and start and it's like, you know, this is not what I want. And vice versa, if, you know, somebody wants to, you know, be very clinically active and they're at a facility that is 150 parts, the chances are they're going to get pretty bored and yeah. not stay for the long run. So absolutely, uh, that's a real kudos to the recruiting and HR to be very specific in their in their listings on case volume and, and the type of cases, how many surgeons there are, how many staff perfusionists there are, that type of thing. And with the perfusion shortage that's sort of going on and projected to go on for a few more years, at least, is it hard to get time off of work to like go on vacations or take a mental break? Or is that sort of stuff difficult? Um, it can be a challenge. Um, and I think a lot of those challenges can get worked out within the group sure. specifically on how they, um, you know, are staff, but how they're also able to, um, I don't want to say manipulate the schedule, but get creative. Sure. Yeah. That, you know, if uh, staff come in early and are relieved, you know, what time they're relieved in the day so they can, you know, anything from get a break to get in a workout to, you know, get their hair done or go to the dentist. So yeah, whatever that um, self care is. Right. So there's yeah. a lot of, uh, you have to get a little creative with that and you have to, you know, have everybody buy in with the schedule to be like, to kind of pay it forward to be, you know, I'm going to come in a little early to relieve my, teammate because they have something going on knowing right. that if everyone's you know bought into the process that when the time comes that they might need a break or an appointment that you know the next person in line is going to to fill in on that uh, yeah. spot as well so so is that all filled sort of worked out within the team like the perfusion team normally yes so yeah the, the manager will kind of lead on the scheduling and make sure it's uh, the cases are assigned appropriately and fairly and no one's getting hard cases and no one's getting, you know, the short, easy ones. And it also gives them a variety at the same time. So let me ask this because you have worked at a, I'm assuming Texas heart was an in-house program. It was. So you have worked at an in-house program and now sort of a third party program at specialty care. What right. would you say are the bigger differences between in-house and third party? So in-house to me was, um, it was very, uh, regimented, mm -hmm. um, like I said, you came in and you were, you know, strictly clinically, you came in, you did your case, did your paperwork, or if there wasn't any, and you went home. Yeah. Um, through a third party, um, it's a business within a business. So, um, you know, I have to obviously take care of my clinical responsibilities, but then also be aware of, I guess, the big picture. So um, back to cannulas, back to inventory, sure. uh, cost savings, being responsible with you know, products because it's part of our group that's responsible for those versus if you're a hospital employee, it's like, well, you know, someone else takes care of that. So right, uh, more well-rounded, um, also uh, maintaining a good relationship with uh, hospital administration, uh, OR staff, the surgeons, right. anesthesia, and so on and so forth, uh, because they are essentially a, a customer. So there's a lot more uh, customer service details, uh, I think as a third party vendor versus, you know, being a, uh, just another, not just another, but another member of the in-hospital staff. Right. So we want to maintain a good brand, maintain a good reputation of our company right. because they are, you know, there is a, a business, a business relationship versus an employee to hospital relationship. Sure. Is that a challenge that you enjoy having taken on that leadership role in the third party side of things? Yeah, I've definitely enjoyed it. It's def definitely been uh, the challenge that I was looking for. Yeah. Uh, 
it uh, it can get difficult at times when it comes down to uh, the business aspect on what's expected, what our role is, because again, we're we're our own business, so uh, you know maintaining records and um, uh, you know safety protocols, updated protocols. So uh, the communication is much higher. There's a lot more emails that get sent. So there's a lot more office uh, visits to or managers, so on and so forth, to make sure that you know we're living up to the expectations that they expect of us, and also what can we do better, you know what is going well, to be able to kind of constantly fine tune everything. So there's definitely, yeah. a, uh, I don't want to say a, a psychology, customer service aspect to it too. Sure, yeah, maintain those relationships. Yeah, I mean also, the hospital is your customer. That that they are absolutely. Customer. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So now that you are in sort of a leadership position and really, I'd imagine that people come to you and ask, you know, I am thinking about being in perfusion or, you know, why did you choose to go into perfusion? Those kind of questions. What, what is your sort of sales pitch? If someone's like, Hey, I'm sort of considering this, um, you know, first off, would you suggest people seek a career in perfusion? And then when you do suggest that they do, how do you like, do you tell them to do research? Like what advice do you give them really? Sure. So oftentimes when I'm presented with that question, it's in the OR and it's probably, you know, during a case or as a case is being prepared. Interesting. Okay. So I'll just start from, you know, square one. So I'm like, here, come follow me and I'll show them the pump okay. and how it works. And it's like, you know, this is what the reservoir does. And here's the centrifugal pump, which is kind of the equivalent to the heart that, you know, contraption underneath. It looks like a big spool of thread is what the lungs are. So. We follow the blood path from the patient through my circuit and, and back into the patient. And oftentimes there are people that are asking our you know, circulators or scrub techs or, or that type of thing. So it's also a point that I can educate them on the case when they're like, what does it mean when the cross clamp goes on? And what happens when you say you're giving retrograde? So I'll go through and say, okay, here's the pump. And if there's a dry erase board, I'll draw a picture. And they're like, I had that instance last week where the nurse documents on the whiteboard, the cross clamp time and the pump time, and uh, they didn't match up. So, you know, I drew a picture on there of, you know, why you go on pump first and then apply the cross clamp. So, you know, for future reference, the, the clamp time can't be longer than the pump time because uh, you can't stop the heart before going on the pump. And then, you know, I drew right. some photos and they're like, oh, that helps a ton. So um, I can kind of use that into dovetail and do you know, what a perfusionist does. And, and I tell them about the schools. And of course, I am uh, biased towards Texas hard. So I'm like, this is <laughs> yeah. where I went. And it's your own model. That, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I just, I, again, back to how I was taught, you know, hands on. It's like, this is what this does. And if you actually show them, because, you know, the heart lung machine is, looks complex at first glance. So it does. It looks very daunting at first glance. I'll be honest with you. Yeah. Right. It, so, being able to use that as a as a stepping stone into you know what we do and even if it's during a case and they'll come check it out and I'll you know show them some things and then I can you know open that conversation into you know it's a great career and I would definitely recommend it yeah here's the educational requirements you might need you can have a discussion on their educational background uh, where all the different schools are how long they are um, and then I can, you know, use that into, you know, the introduction of there is a huge shortage now. Now would be a great time to get into the profession. There's a ton really of jobs. Is. Yeah. And so, and I think that might quell a lot of fears with looking to go into the profession because it's like go through all this training. If there's no jobs, then it could be, um, you know, a, a negative. So absolutely. Cause it is an investment. All, it's an investment of time and money to get, to get, to go through school. It is. So try to make it all positive. And in the same sense, you know, because we're looking at somebody I can identify that, you know, works and lives in my city and I have shortages so that I could, you know, know to be like, this is a guy to keep my eyes on. If he does to be like, Hey, you know, we're probably going to have some opening. So we wouldn't be in the situation maybe that I was in uh, 12 years ago to say, you know, you have the chance to come back home. And yeah. luckily here in Minneapolis, we have a lot of count. So if you're willing to put in the time and investment to go to school, I would definitely, you know, do what I could do in my power to, you know, have you have the chance to come back home. Should that be, you know, something yeah. you want? 
in 18 to 24 months, whenever the, right. you know, whenever they're out of the program. Right. Yeah, right. absolutely. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today on checking the vitals. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, it's been great. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can put the word out and let folks know that this is a great career and that definitely something that they should uh, look into. And, uh, you know, it's not a scary thing. It's a great field. It's only growing and advancing. Thank you for listening to Checking the Vitals. If you enjoyed the content we provide, please leave us a five-star rating and review. It really does help people find the show. And make sure you subscribe so you hear our interviews with healthcare innovators every Monday.